All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Remarkable Coach podcast. I am here. I'm joined today uh, by Sarah Gilbert. Sarah is an award-winning business strategist and mindset coach. She helps service-based entrepreneurs grow their business in their way. Sarah Gilbert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation, Michael. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here and and chat about uh, about all of the things. Um, to kind of kick it off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and exactly what it is you do? Um, from as long as I remember, I've always been a challenger. So, you know, challenging the status quo of things are supposed to be like this in life and you're supposed to follow this path. And so as long as I could remember, I was a challenger. So today I actually challenge people to think outside the box, meaning to challenge their belief, to challenge the status quo. And that's what's really mean when I say, you know, make a difference their way, you know, to stop listening or this is what you're supposed to do or what I should be doing, or this is the path and it can only be this way and really mm -hmm. design it. And really like I, I sh not ch shock, but I really challenge my clients beliefs so they can live really the life that they want under their terms. So I call them like under their rules. And mm -hmm. that's really my purpose. So that's what I do. I like it. I like it. You mentioned you mentioned the word design in there. Is this is it like a lifestyle design kind of thing? Or is it something is it different? It's, it's in every aspect. So just before our call is funny because uh, so I, I serve service based entrepreneurs. And mm -hmm. just before our call, I was talking with one of my clients who is a tax specialist, but like mm -hmm. a high end tax specialist. And I remember when we started working together, it was like, Sarah, you know, you don't understand. I'm worried. I'm in a business where you have to take every client. You have to say yes to everything you have to. And I'm like, eh, you don't have anything. You don't have to anything in life. You get to choose. You get mm -hmm. to choose how you want to run your business. You get to choose the type of clients that you want to you want to have. You get to choose if you want to finish at four or at seven. You get to ch you get to choose the whole thing. You need to decide. So yes, it comes with lifestyle, but it understand it also comes with what difference do you want to make? Because our businesses are really the biz the purpose of the business is our life purpose. Mm -hmm. So that how do you want to make a difference in the world around you with that vehicle, which is your business? Mm -hmm. And that's really what people are buying from you is that transformation. Mm -hmm. So you get to decide how you're going to structure it and what are the rules of the game that you want to have? Because at the end of the day, when this is all done, my goal is that there's nothing going to be left. Like I've gave it everything I've got. Mm -hmm. And I want my clients to say, I've given everything I got. Mm -hmm. And so it does sometimes come into the lifestyle, but it has also in all the design of the business you want to create. Sure. What, what sorts of things do you find people struggling with? Just listening to societal norms, that sort of thing? Or does it go more well, personal lot, than that? Or? Well, a lot of people, I think where I where I challenge them is in the beliefs. So they want to change a behavior without understanding the belief that's at the root of that behavior. So let me give you an example. I have a client who wants to do videos, but she knows how to do it. She knows the structure, she knows the technology, she knows everything, but she's still not doing it. Mm -hmm. And then she's, you know, like wondering, why am I not doing this? Why am I procrastinating? What not? And we had to dig into what's the belief around that. And mm -hmm. the belief always comes around judgment, rejection. It always mm -hmm. comes around that. And until I don't, I'm not conscious about the belief, I'm never going to be able to change a behavior. Mm -hmm. So once we, we realize that everything around that we've created as a life is totally aligned with the beliefs that we have, then we get to actually bring into consciousness and bring awareness to what is the belief that I have towards that thing. And then mm -hmm. I can do something about it. So yeah. one of the big challenges that people don't understand, people don't know their beliefs. Mm -hmm. 
They really don't know. And the belief is what driving every one of our behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that's the fascinating part. I'm, I'm smiling throughout this because I can relate. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Just, you know, it can be video, it can be whatever, creating some kind of content, knowing that you should be doing something, knowing that you can do it and that you can do it damn well and still not doing it for some reason. What are some of the reasons that that you found, you know, subconscious, subliminal, whatever, like why why do people why do people block themselves? If we, when we understand how the brain works, it clarifies a lot of things. So the brain's purpose is to keep us alive, which means it, it's comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And so the brain's purpose is always look to see if there's a threat because it wants to keep us alive. So the biggest fear is death. So now if we put a layer around that, then there's rejection. Because obviously if I'm rejected from my tribe, then I might be eaten by, the, by a cyber tooth tiger, which... It sounds silly when we say it, but the brain still works like that. Mm-hmm. Now, fear of rejection is what comes up all the time. Now, we, we might put other labels on it. I'm a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to be judge and judgment. These are all this. It's we're taking we're using different words to say that. Sarah, and, you're, you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Keep going. And, like, and that of not being loved so these are all like parallel words like i call them but the root of that is the fear of death the fear of rejection mm-hmm. so i have a client day like he he takes on every client or he used to take on every client and i'm like okay hold on why are we taking like why are we taking all these clients he's like and he's doing everything for his client and i'm like okay like it's not and finally we dig in and we dig in and we dig in this okay sarah I want, I want them to love me because obviously what's the opposite of love? It's being ignored, but it's also rejection. Apathy. Yeah. Or rejection. Yeah, sure. Exactly. So it all comes back to judgment, rejection, and it all mm-hmm. comes back to around that. So, which is interesting. So when we know there's a behavior that we want to do or stop doing for that matter, start asking myself ourselves is, Okay, what's, what could be the belief around that? Mm-hmm. And that, when you dig in and you really let this, the question sink, you'll get all your answers. Mm-hmm. Because like I said, your, our beliefs is the reflection of our reality. That's what, that's what we see. Mm-hmm. And that's it, you know? So, but that connection, we don't always make it. So... <clears throat> Death and rejection are the, let's say, like the, the, the deepest level, like the true beliefs. What do you, what are, the, what are some common beliefs that you find your clients, people in general, entrepreneurs in general, you know, death and rejection, I, I, I can only assume would be wrapped up in something less terrifying, something more common. Like what kind of beliefs, is it, does that question make sense? Well, there's the there's a lot of beliefs. Anything that starts with I have to and I should. Mm-hmm. Those are all those are all what I call them outside pressure. Mm-hmm. So in life there's this outside pressure and then there's inner pressure. That outside pressure is I should be doing, I must do, uh these are all like outside, you know, mm-hmm. of the outside sure. norm. And what happens is that there's so much of it that We tend to go like this because, Mm -hmm. oh, this person is doing this, so I should be doing that as well. And this person is doing that and I should, and we should all over ourselves, right? And we (laughs) get to nourish that internal pressure. Mm -hmm. That internal pressure is, what's the difference do I want to make? Who do Mm -hmm. I want to serve? How do I want to leave a mark? That contribution and that what is the thing that I want to contribute, which is something bigger than ourselves? Mm-hmm. Or what is that different, that driving force? So we keep on listening to the outside noise, but we forget that where we should be really focusing is that inside voice. Mm-hmm. And once I listen to that, the must and the should and whatever, we pay less attention to them. 
Mm-hmm. Well, start when we start paying attention to, um, you know, how we talk, because one of my expertise is on psycholinguistic. It's understanding the power of the words that we use, how they influence our behavior and other people's behavior. Mm-hmm. And if I say, you know, I'm a perfectionist, that is such a huge excuse or a huge nice way to say, I'm afraid of rejection. Mm-hmm. Well, then I am putting myself in a limiting belief. I'm afraid of judgment is another one that we'll say. So, or, you know, like it's always been done like this. That's how our industry work. Mm -hmm. Those are all beliefs that we will name things that we will say that actually hide those beliefs that we have, those limiting beliefs that we have. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Yep. Completely. Completely. Um, The inner pressure, the inner voice understanding, paying attention to listening to that will help block out some of the external stuff. Not everyone comes into the world, um, you know, with a, with a cause, with a purpose, with a purpose that they know, right? Mm -hmm. Um, How, how can someone, how can you help someone find their purpose, if, if they don't know what it is, mm. and they're, they're you know, like you said, they're kind of going on this kind of downhill slalom, just being bumped from outside pressures back and forth, and they don't know what their own purpose is, what their own voice is telling them, how can they, how can they tune into that? I love the question, and I love how you stated it, and reframed it as in a purpose that they know, because if we're here, it's because we do have a purpose, we do have a sure. mission. So, um, and, you know, like finding your life purpose seems like such a complicated thing. And the way that I see it and the way that I really help my, na- my clients navigate through that is, I call it your intrinsic mission comes from one of two things. That's it. Mm-hmm. Either something I lived in my life that I want more people to live, or I live something in my life that I want less people to live. So let's take an example. I have a client who's a financial advisor, has been working like a beast for probably 42 years, built a huge business and everything. Worked a lot, like didn't see his family, whatever. Why? And when we dig in, because when he was a kid, he went to school with clothes that had holes in them and people made fun of him. Mm -hmm. And he said, never again. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that this doesn't happen to me, nor this doesn't happen to anybody else again. Mm-hmm. And that is why today his driving force was to help people bring into stability so they can have money to be able to protect themselves and their family from comments like that, from mm-hmm. feeling like that. So we all live something and the further out we look, the further out we'll see. Mm -hmm. So the further back you look in your life, you'll see that there's something that you lived and you'll say never again, or everyone should live this. And Mm -hmm. that is our purpose. So you really want to take the time to ask yourself those questions. Like, why do I do what I do? And where does that come from? And then events, life events are going to start to pop up. Oh, yeah. I remember I did this and I remember I did that. And I remember, and then at one point you'll go, this is it. So continuously asking, where does that come from? Where does that come from? And going with my favorite word in the entire planet is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And going with curiosity and you'll put the finger on an event that happened. And it tends to be usually around the age of seven, uh, which really goes in line with the development of the brain and seven, nine in those area. And there's a purpose in there. So when you Mm -hmm. build a business, it's a vehicle that's going to help you deliver on that purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So tactically speaking, then, Mm -hmm. is that something that someone could do just like journaling? To, to work to figure that out? Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Um, well, journaling is a great way. Obviously, if you can talk it out with somebody, because that mm-hmm. somebody 
that other person will act is not emotionally charged in that situation versus sure. we. So yes, in the best world, you will want to talk about with somebody because that person will be able to challenge. So where does that come from? What does that do? Mm -hmm. huh, what mm -hmm. happened then? You know, sure. um, journaling would be the second option because when you're journaling, it's a conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. The thing is, when you're with yourself, we tend to sabotage, criticize, and judge mm -hmm. ourselves because mm -hmm. we tend to be very good at judging ourselves. We don't need other people that much to judge. We can do it pretty well ourselves, you know. Yep. So that would be the second. The first one would really be, and you can make it, make it. Not a game, but it, yes, you know, like a conversation with somebody that you are very comfortable with and saying, okay, mm -hmm. what happened in your life that mm -hmm. you want less people to live or you would like more people to live? And that I call it, that's your gift. That's mm -hmm. your gift to the world is that you lived something and you want to share that mm -hmm. and saying, okay, never again or everyone should. I like it. I like yeah. it. I want to I want to share an idea that that I've shamelessly stolen from one of my coaches. Um, when you're if you're when you're journaling by yourself to try to figure out to try to get to some difficult answers, right? To dig mm -hmm. into the the tough stuff. Um, something that that helps that works for me, again that I got from my coach is to literally put on my Indiana Jones hat. Oh yes. And think about it like like it's like it's an adventure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you're 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 going into the dark cave to pull that jewel out, and you gotta you gotta get down through all the nasty stuff to get to the to the to the jewel at the heart of the cave. So, at least for for me as a you know <laughs> rambunctious adventuresome man, um, thinking about it in that sense, you know, when I'm when I'm journaling. Uh, can help quite a bit. I think it's kind of a, a fun way to to look at it. Definitely. And it's kind of also, you know, on the same line as creating your alter ego. Mm -hmm. Sure. And also, if you create your alter ego, doing it from that place of your alter ego, your alter ego is not stuck in that same mindset and those same emotions. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And I love the word play. You know, I love playing. So, like, can we do it and just have fun? Yeah. Yeah. We tend to make things so seriously and so in our heads. Let's mm -hmm. just have fun because so fear and pleasure can't do not um, live in the same. They don't coexist. So if there's fear, there's no pleasure. And if there's mm -hmm. pleasure, pleasure is the antidote to fear. Mm -hmm. Well, can I have fun with this? Can I have go with curiosity and say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, like and remove the and removes the judgment out of it and say. Let's just explore mm -hmm. and just have fun because we know that it's in that fun that the best ideas come, the best solutions come. That's where all the creativity, that's where magic happens. Mm -hmm. So, and with that fun, it actually reconnects us with our body. Mm -hmm. So if we look at how we work, we have our brain, which is the intellectual one, but our biggest memory is our body memory. Mm -hmm. So 80% of the information moves from body to mind. Only 20% of the information goes from mind to body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So reconnecting and seeing where's the answer coming from. If it's coming from my head, it's not the right place. Mm -hmm. So how can I go back into my body memory you know like and people sometimes don't understand when we talk about body memory and i'm like you know what have you ever sat in a, a, or somebody asks you your password for your computer and you're like i have no idea move i gotta i gotta do it i gotta pretend to type it and then i can tell you what and it is yeah and then get it that is body memory so our biggest memory is actually in our body mm -hmm. so when you're doing the exercise bringing in play bringing play actually gets you out of your head and brings you back in your body Mm -hmm. And that's really where the magic happens. So when we're looking for answers, asking ourselves, where does the answer come from? Does it come from my head or does it come from my body? We all mm -hmm. know that the best answers come from our bodies. So our, mm -hmm. that's where we say like the gut instinct. Yeah. Because there is such a thing, you know? I remember 
I think it was um, Unlimited Power, uh, Tony Robbins' first book. He says that uh, psychology follows physiology. So if you're feeling like crap, if you can just stand up and do some jumping jacks, get the get your physiology moving, then your your psychology will will be able to follow that better. Yeah, and, and it, re- it really goes. The, the latest science and neuroscience actually state that it goes both ways. Okay. Yeah. So your mind sure. will change your body, and your body will change your mind. It really goes both ways. So I think that we have we tend to have a preference. Mm-hmm. But understanding that, yes, it definitely goes goes both ways, because if you're not feeling so good, go for a walk, you'll feel a lot better after, you know? Sure. So, yes. Yeah, good stuff. You mentioned um, psycholinguistics earlier on. How is it, how it, is that different? And if it is, how is that different from NLP? Um, well, so it, it is a branch of NLP because I'm also an NLP coach. And when we do NLP, uh, we do t- we do look at and we do address language. So mm-hmm. for me, I really went deeper in that in that field because it just fascinated me really mm-hmm. uh, probably because listening to people is what I do for a living, right? Um, and so it is part. It's just a deeper part. So when people do NLP, we all get something out of like we go a different route. I took this that root root. I took the root of psycholinguistic because when and this is really funny and it's funny because funny and not because when I do conferences on this nobody wants to talk to me after like nobody because (laughs) when somebody talks and you pay attention the words that they use how they structure their sentences even a tense of the words that they use of the verbs that they use you know Mm. exactly everything that's going on in their head because they tell you Mm -hmm. So I can know ahead of time if a client is going to achieve their goal or not, not by the answers, not by the actions or what Mm -hmm. they're saying that they're going to, how they talk. And that's where psycholinguistic comes in. It's like, Mm -hmm. okay, how can we tweak a word that's going to make a huge difference and being conscious that the words that you use have a huge impact on our behavior. How does, give me an example of how tense can give you insight into what someone's thinking. Because I, I too, I, I studied, my undergrad is in Japanese language and literature. And I, a big part of that, uh, that study for me was ling- just regular linguistics. And I find linguistics absolutely fascinating. Um, so this is, a, this is a cool topic for me. Um, so I have a lot of examples that are in French, so I'll try to translate them here because <laughs> top of mind, we're like, yes, this, 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 but they're, they're in French, so we won't be able to use them here. Um, but um, I'm trying to find examples in English that are, that are in part of the tense. Okay, do you, do you work have, mostly with French clients? I have a 50-50 split Okay. because uh, my mother tongue is French, mm-hmm. so I really have a 50-50 split in terms of um, uh, of, of language. but um yeah so let, let's move on now probably something will pop up back in my head in terms of the tense um okay. yeah okay <laughs> no no worries no worries. Google translate in the meantime in my head you know yeah yeah sure no it's it's gonna be like it's gonna be like a shower thought or a walk you're gonna walk your dog later or something and it's gonna pop in you're gonna be like oh i should have known <laughs> okay i'll email you say that's the one <laughs> those are the ones yeah uh, well, you shoot me an email and we'll add it to the show notes. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. You're on, you know. So I don't know. I, I don't want to leave psycholinguistics quite yet. Tell me, like, just give me some, give me three super interesting, cool things about psycholinguistics. What are, what are three of your favorite quirks? Well, a lot or... of the things that I like to really pay attention to is anything that follows I am. Uh-huh. Sure. Because anything that follows I am is a command for the brain. Why? Okay. Because it's part of our identity. Uh huh. So our brain will always do whatever it needs to do to stay aligned with the identity that we have. Uh-huh. So if we take an example, somebody that says, I'm a smoker versus somebody who says, I smoke. Which one do you think is going to have a harder time stop smoking? Right. Exactly. One of them, one of them is an action and the other is an identity. Exactly. Totally. So if I say, well, I'm a procrastinator, 
your wish is my command. Mm -hmm. So I pay a lot of attention to when people talk of what are their I am statements. Mm -hmm. Because that is the identity that they're giving themselves. So I'm a procrastinator. I'm a perfectionist. I'm whatever it is. The I am is a command for a belief. Mm -hmm. um, I should. And I'm like, okay. Should is an outside pressure. Mm -hmm. Do you want or not? What do mm -hmm. you want? Um, I have to. That is, again, it's like these are pressure, external pressures that I'm mm -hmm. that I'm taking in. So I have to do this. I have to do that. And I keep on saying, you don't have, we don't have, and we don't have to do anything in life. I get to. That's so I was just going to say at, at Boxer, at my company, we only say I, we get to do something. We never, no one ever has to do anything. That's it, you know? Yeah. Um, and these are all small words that obviously will derail your behavior. Mm -hmm. Because if I have to do that, even if I don't want to, I will still do because I have to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we start paying attention to those little words, mm -hmm. then we start to noticing, oh, why am I going this way or that way or this way? I should do this. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do it or do you don't want to do it? Mm -hmm. No. Um, when we use negative sentences, the brain doesn't understand the negative. Because if we tell me a negative sentence, the brain needs to do and then undo. So if mm -hmm. I tell my, my daughter, don't drop your glass of orange juice, well, count to three, the glass of orange juice is spilled because the brain has to dr see it drop and then undo it. By then, the glass of orange juice is, is, is spilled out. Dropping so, the orange juice built into the sentence. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like, how do we, how can I really change my sentences? Uh -huh. Another one that I like is the word but. So the word but in a sentence is, in a sentence actually cuts the sentence in half. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a manager and I see one of my employees saying, what you did was really interesting, but maybe next time we could do it differently. The first part of the sentence. The say brain, and. And. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at the same time. And we see these sentences, we hear those sentences where we talk with our team, we talk with the client. Um, so, you know, these are small words. It doesn't mean to not say but anymore. It mm -hmm. means be conscious of where you're going to say it. Sure. You know, because there are some times that I want to cut off that first part of the sentence. So psycholinguistic is all about understanding those words, understanding human patterns that people have as well. So we have people who are moving towards, people who are moving away. So some people are going towards goals. Some people want to move away from goals. Understanding how, which pattern I have helps me also understand which pattern the other person has and enter mm -hmm. their style, spot, talk to them in their language. And these are the details where when we see conflicts, it's very often just communication styles that are different. Mm -hmm. And our role is to get clarity on that. Interesting. That's mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, that's cool stuff. Um, I like it. So let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what got you into coaching? What got you excited to be a coach? Why, why coaching? Well, that was not the career path. First, it was to be a psychologist, and then it was be it would it was to be a kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. So, um, so now it's kind of a mix of both that I do. Um, but really, I was in corporate doing business development and everything. And at one point, I was like, you know what? There's got to be a better way than how we do this. So, when I actually launched my business over a decade ago, it was more on a business consulting framework. And what really got me more into a coaching moment is I was having this meeting with a client for like mm -hmm. their, their, their marketing strategy. And they're super excited. They're like, awesome, Sarah, this is exactly what we need. We're going to do it. And then I like really nice words. The problem is it was the third time we're having the same meeting. Mm. And I'm like, there's something I didn't get. Mm -hmm. And this is where I went back and got 
double star certification in coaching and whatnot to be able to understand human behavior. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't understand, it doesn't matter the plan, the strategy, the service, the product that you offer. Mm-hmm. If you can't understand the human behavior that's behind that. Mm-hmm. And I've always had this need and desire need to help people. <laughs> you know, like I was the one who was doing all kinds of fundraising and sold all kinds of stuff when I was a kid, you know, like did a petition for belugas and I've never even met, saw a beluga in my life, but that desire to help uh-huh. like i call it the mother teresa gene i was definitely born with it you know yeah nice yeah right on mm. um who are your clients you mentioned service-based entrepreneurs but tell us more about about who your clients are so service-based entrepreneurs in the terms of the business is their service, their expertise. So I have a lot of uh, financial advisors, a lot of tax advisors, lawyers, and other coaches. Mm -hmm. And what really makes it interesting for me, fascinating versus working with a service-based entrepreneur versus a entrepreneur that sells this, is that you really need to understand both human aspects. The entrepreneur and the entrepreneur needs to understand his clients. Because Mm -hmm. when you're a service-based entrepreneur, a lot of people think that they're selling themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's where it plays in your head. Because mm-hmm. if a client doesn't take the recommendation, the service, they take it like a personal rejection. It's mm-hmm. not they didn't want this thing, is that they didn't want me. Mm-hmm. And that's where understanding the behavior. And for me, it's that complexity of the, the human that's behind the business that becomes very fascinating. It's really Mm -hmm. playing in their head and helping them understand what's going on in their head. And I'm the type of coach that my goal is like that my clients don't need me. So I tell them something, they react. I tell them what I said, why I said that, and what does that do? So they can actually put that in their professional toolbox so they can help their clients with the same thing. So if I have a client who's afraid of, you know, has a limiting belief, We'll work on it, and then I'll tell them exactly what I said, how I structured my sentence, whatever, so they can help their clients with their limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's really what I find fascinating in a service-based entrepreneur because it's it's all in our heads. It's Uh all, you know. Sure. Yeah. So, how much of how much? I'm curious to know how much of what you do spills into you know, marketing and things like that. Because for me, obviously my company Boxer is a marketing agency. If you see all these books back up here behind me, there's a fair chunk of those that are all about behavioral science, consumer psychology. This is stuff that I'm big into as well. Um, do you, is, is, are you helping your clients with, um, you know, marketing sometimes as well? Like how to position themselves, how to think about how they position themselves, their, their communications and that sort of thing? Well, there's three pillars in which I help them is marketing, productivity, and mindset. So those are okay. really the three pillars that I use. And marketing is a huge aspect because marketing, the goal of marketing is one of two things. You either want to anchor the belief that your clients have, or you want to challenge a belief that your clients have. Mm-hmm. It's not, marketing is not about selling your service and, No, it's all about beliefs because we operate from beliefs. Mm -hmm. And even Harvard made a study and they stated that 95% of the decisions, buying decisions that humans do are based on emotions. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand what our clients, what are the emotions that they want? So I often say as a marketing strategy, you sell them what they want, you give them what they need. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs a plan. Nobody wants a plan, a strategy. What they're buying is the freedom. What they're buying is they're buying an emotion. Yeah, certainty, safety. Exactly, you know? So what is the emotion that they're buying? And that is how you want to position your marketing. And there's Mm -hmm. many things in terms of human behavior that we want to understand that's going to make our marketing stronger. You know, Mm -hmm. the words that we use, um, the, the different behavioral patterns that people have, These are all things that you're going to be using in your marketing because there's like 10 ways to present the same sentence, the same message, 
But according to different behavioral patterns that people have, you're going to position this, the message differently. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand those to be able to communicate those. So really, those are the three pillars that I work with my clients, like marketing, productivity, and mindset. And so, yes, it's a huge, huge part. And to, to be able to understand that, and it's, it's truly fascinating, fascinating to learn and fascinating to share as well, you know? Yeah, the, the, the human equation is unpredictable, but also predictable in many ways. <laughs> and it's yeah. worth, I think it's also worth uh, mentioning too, like, as you, you mentioned the Harvard study, people buy, uh, make the decision to purchase based on their emotions, and then they follow up to kind of validate that decision with logic. Yes, they so, do. So 100%. And when we position our message, we need to position our message in a way that's going to answer the more number one conversation that people have is the conversation with themselves. Mm -hmm. So we need to word it in a way that I can tell myself that. And mm -hmm. that from there, I'll get home or I'll get at the office. I'll use that same wording to be able to tell my partner, business or professional, why I decided to do business with you. Mm -hmm. So it's not rare that you're going to see me in social media and the post starts with, Sarah, mm -hmm. how do I do this? Why? Because I'm putting this sentence in your mouth. Right. Because I know that's a pain point. I know that's a conversation you're having with yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to get into that conversation. So as an entrepreneur, it requires knowing our clients way above the simple demographic. Mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes we forget to do that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. There's it reminds me. There's a uh, there's a musician. Uh, her name she goes by Adrian Buckaroo Girl, and she's a, a Western singer songwriter. And every she she has a little bit of a cult following, I think. And one of the reasons she's so popular is because her marketing is so excellent. Every social media post that she writes it, it feels like a diary entry. It starts out, "Dear Cowgirl." And then she goes on and just says something that really like, you know, just it's, it resonates with her tribe, with her crew, with her people, with her gals. <laughs> yes. And, and it comes and now you see that one ties in also with the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. The brain works in image first, in words second. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing a dear cowgirl, I see myself mm -hmm. as the cowgirl. And yep. People remember the story, not the information. Mm -hmm. So I often say, you know, like in our marketing, look at everything that's around you. Mm -hmm. Everything that's around you, if you look at it properly, if you take the time, you'll see that there's something tied into the message you want to communicate. So... You know, I often share a story that a few weeks ago I was at the store and the clerk, they, they dropped, they dropped blueberries and everyone of the staff was just so busy picking up the blueberries that nobody went and picked up a new, a new, another basket of blueberries for the client. Somebody just said, ma'am, go and get another one. And I'm standing there. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Missed an opportunity. This business put in business efficiency, more important than client experience. Mm -hmm. What has to do with what I, what I work with my clients is what's the client experience that you can offer. Mm -hmm. But if I don't pay attention to what's going around me and saying, how does that link with my message? Then I've got a marketing opportunity that's lost. Mm -hmm. So your best marketing is really in everyday life and bringing that story and saying, okay, what's the underlining message that I want to share in there that is tied in with what I do, how I mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, blending in marketing strategy, like in your marketing strategy, storytelling is super, super powerful because it just takes the brain from a world of probability to a world of possibility. Yeah. There's the, the classic Seth Godin book, All Marketers Are Storytellers. Oh. That's yeah, it's a it's a great book. You should check it out. If you haven't if you haven't read it, it's a good one. <laughs> I haven't. I will definitely check it out. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it's exactly what you were just saying. <laughs> oh yes. And and it's a skill that mm -hmm. we can it's a practice. 
for sure. 100%. You know, it's like anything else. We just practice it. Yeah. That's it. You know, so, and that a lot, entrepreneurs gain a lot to develop, mm -hmm. you know, but it takes awareness as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think we, we covered a bit about mindset in the psycholinguistics chat, and we just talked about marketing. Tell us a little bit about productivity. I also want to be cognizant uh, and aware of your time. I know mm -hmm. we're coming up, so um, mm -hmm. just let me know if you got to run, but I'd love to chat at least briefly about uh, productivity and that, that third pillar that we haven't hit on quite yet. Well, productivity is about having a business that runs like a business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so having a business that's not always dependent on you and that your business has no place to be in your head. So mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, we tend to have our businesses in our head, but that is the most precious square footage that we have. Mm -hmm. So how do I structure my business to be able to take that information and out? So in productivity, we I talk about, you know, yes, cl the classic client, client, uh, um, client segmentation, client journey, developing these tools, time management. It's mm -hmm. funny how time management is just emotional management. That's mm -hmm. it. That you have to love yourself and love your clients so much to put yourself first. Mm -hmm. Time is like money in a budget. If you don't put you pay if you don't pay yourself first, there's not going to be any money left at the end of the month. Well, time mm -hmm. management is the same thing. And in this world where we're just so busy being busy. So I work with a concept which is called like, like the ideal week, which is not a revolution where mm -hmm. we're all time blocking. Mm -hmm. When I actually am intentional with my time, that's where we can see that we achieve so much more. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, like time is not something that we have. It is something that we create. So Interesting. Looking at it. people put so much pressure on themselves on, oh, I have to, you know, answer all emails right now. I have to answer every call right now. You know what? The, the death rate for an unanswered email is officially 0%. <laughs> you know? So it's, true. it's if you answer to the email, if you take your emails twice a day, nobody's going to die. People mm -hmm. think that we need to be always. So we're putting pressure on ourselves that doesn't even exist. When a client says, I would need, need this, instead of saying, perfect, I'll get to you, but these two by the end of the day, and you're hitting yourself because you're, you said that, and your team is hating you because you said that, you can say, mm -hmm. Mr. Smith, I'll get this to you by Friday. And you know what? 99% of the time, Mr. Smith is going to say, no worries. I'm not in a rush. Yeah. So that's where productivity is. So yes, we want a business that's structured in the business that's no longer in your head, that we stop reinventing the wheel all the time. So we have processes for mm -hmm. client meeting, onboarding clients, servicing clients. We have processes in there and we manage our time and our energy to be able mm -hmm. to fulfill and really in nourish that internal pressure we're talking before and move some of that external pressure. Mm -hmm. And so that it's a huge, huge piece because as entrepreneurs, many, 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 are they, they love their clients. They want to help. They want to save the world. Yeah. And I always say there's a difference between helping and saving. Uh -huh. We want to help our clients not save our clients. So it's an interesting distinction. It is huge. Yeah. Because helping someone, if, if let's say somebody refers me a client who's not my ideal client. Mm -hmm. When I'm not aware, I will save, I will take it because I don't have anything to work. Like, I don't know what to do. So I'll take that client, even if it's not my ideal client. Mm -hmm. But when I'm aware and I understand the difference between helping and saving, I might say, I'm not the best person for you, but here's a resource. Here's a referral. Mm -hmm. I'm helping, not saving. Mm -hmm. So I challenge often my clients on that. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Did we help or did we save? And mm -hmm. I always get answers like, oh, you know, it's conditioning because we want to help. We want to serve. But an hour is an hour that I taught that I spend it with 
a top client or that I spend it with somebody who's not even my ideal client an hour is an hour. Mm -hmm. And so many times entrepreneurs, I say, it's like, it's like a, 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 you know, a dental surgeon doing a cleaning. Mm -hmm. We're losing <laughs> expertise. And they're like, I really don't like it when you say that, sir. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> it brings them to reality of, yeah, an hour is an hour. Yeah. So the, the productivity when we are entrepreneurs is the only time is the only thing we've got. Right. So let's be intentional with it. It's interesting to think about, you know, the, the saying that I've heard a number of times in various groups is that, um, you know, we all have the same 24 hours in a day that Elon Musk has. It's true. And it's like, you've, if you've got one hour and you can do A, B, or C, which one's gonna, which one's gonna give you the most power to, to do what you're here to do? Yeah, and like, so our goal in terms of productivity is to spend 80% of our time in our zone of genius. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. And often as entrepreneurs, and sometimes I get caught up in that one too, we mm -hmm. end up being very expensive assistants. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so it's an hour is an hour. You get to mm -hmm. pick where you're going to put it. Yeah. So productivity is a huge one to not just for our time, but, but for our fulfillment. Yeah. And that's it. That's great, Sarah. Is, is, there, is there anything that you would like to chat about that we haven't touched upon yet? No, I think we've covered good grounds. Uh, I think we could have continued talking for like a while <laughs> on these pillars, but I think if people take the awareness of their mindset, of their inner chatter, awareness of the goals of marketing is just to anchor beliefs, challenge belief, and being aware that an hour is an hour. Mm -hmm. And just that awareness is going to make a huge difference. In life. Good stuff. Sarah Gilbert, thank you so much for joining us on The Remarkable Coach. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. See you soon. Yes.